Um, so welcome to our program. Uh, this is the Unraveling the Mysteries of Migration with Modus Technology. Um, and again, this is, this is what came out today. It was in Forbes, it was in Bloomberg, it was in all, all the different magazines um, as of this morning. I guess, I guess uh, the World Wildlife Fa uh, Foundation had a press release this morning because these numbers had just come in. Prior to that, it was up to 2012 and they had, the numbers were 50% and now they've moved up to 68%. And to your point, Jim, um, not every area is, is equal. North America has really de only declined 33%, but the big decline is really in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, that's 94%. And most of those areas are in the Amazon and, and along the shorelines where a lot of development is occurring. So that's where a lot of the species are, are getting hammered. Um, freshwater ecosystems are the greatest hit. 84% of species that depend on freshwater ecosystems have declined significantly. Um, so it's just something to think about. I always look at this, if you look at, oh wait, let's see. So did I not, oh yeah, so this is the living planet index, right? And if you see, this is this is the number of species in 1970. If, you, if that's the baseline, so they're calling that 100%. And if you go down, um, you'll see that it's decreasing dr drastically up until 2016 um, by, by two thirds. I just wanna show you, it, it correlates perfectly to population increase in my opinion. <laughs> if you put these two graphs on top of each other, the, the increase in humans equals the increase, the decrease in, in wildlife, which I guess is not a big surprise to any of us. Um, and then of course we are all familiar with that three billion birds gone. So the, the bird species have decreased by a third, and uh, I always call this the canaries in the coal mine. Um, it, it's, it's disturbing because I feel like, the, you know, with, between the pandemic and the species information and the food system crashing and then all of the climate issues, you know, and the hurricanes, the forest fire, it just feels like nature is breaking down to me. Um, I know, I don't know, it's just, this has been a rough year for those of us in conservation um, that care about species. And I, I feel that humans are, are the direct cause that are di disrupting natural ecosystems. And, um, you know, why would a land trust get into this level of bird conservation? Well, you know, just like the World Wildlife Federation is, is um, monitoring species across the world. We're monitoring the birds in our area. And I feel back to the canary in the coal mine, birds are the indicator. So if you're losing 33% of your birds, you're losing, I mean, you can see that the way these graphs are, you're losing the reptiles and amphibians, the mammals, the fish, they're all losing together. It's just one species that we're easily, that we can easily monitor. Um, and again, a land trust is involved because habitat loss is the number one threat. If you lose habitat, if you de diminish the impact of your habitat, you're losing species. And that's really the big reason why the Amazon is decreasing. They're burning it for agriculture. Um, most, the, one of the biggest reasons why we have habitat loss is because of our food production. We're trying to feed 8 billion people and it comes at the expense of habitat, of, of biodiversity, because there's no more arable land left. So anything that we're going to use has to be done at the expense of whatever preserved land we have for, for wildlife. Um, and again, like our Rushton banding station was an attempt to start monitoring birds as they related to the agricultural practices at Rushton Farm 10 years ago. I guess it's 11 years ago now. And um, obviously we're a small scale organic farm and, and all of the methods done at Rushton are done in, in harmony with the surrounding ecosystems. And I think it can show that there is a way to grow food and help wildlife at the same time. Now, this is a small scale, it's, it's feeding 125 families, but I think it is a good model for larger systems if, if there's any way to improve those systems. Um, so we've been monitoring the birds at Rushton Farm three times a year. We do spring migration, fall migration, and we also do um, 
a MAPS program, which is monitoring our breeding populations. And, and our birds are doing fairly well. And I think we're like Jim, we have a bit of an oasis effect. We're close to Ridley Creek State Park. And so the birds can depend on this area, especially with Bonnie Van Allen, how she's conserved so much of this land um, in the past 30 years that I feel that uh, that's, we, we also have an oasis. So we're very lucky that way, but we wanna make sure our oasis stays as an oasis and, and creates this, this refuge for, for birds that are moving around and other wildlife. Um, this is just what our numbers look like over time. Allison Fetterman put this great report together, which we're gonna release soon. And actually it's already out of date because we just got our hundredth species the other day. It was a blue grosbeak and that was very exciting. So not bad for a shrubby, scrubby, um, organic farm with some wildlife habitat around it. Um, last year was a great year. And it, it's, it's like you said, Jim, it seems that we're getting more birds each year. But I, I think there is an oasis effect because development is occurring all around us. And so I think there's less places mm -hmm. for the birds to come. So they're getting all kind of smushed oh. into our site. It, 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 there's no way to tell, of course, but it is interesting. Um, oh, but isn't that what MODIS is about? We can find out where the birds are going. And, ex yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've all been sitting at this banding station for over 11 years. We band our birds. We see the abundance and the diversity of birds at one point in time at Rushton Woods Preserve. But once they leave our station, we have no idea what they're doing or where they go. And we only know if they survive, if they come back to the station and we recapture them. Um, so we joined forces whoops, with uh, Powder Mill Nature Reserve and the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art. And of course, Scott Weidensall and Dave Brinker from Project Alnet. And we uh, created a collaboration to track the species that we're working with. And initially, um, you know, we thought, oh, whatever, we'll just focus on our birds at Willistown. And so it was a great idea. They wanted to focus on northern solid owls, and we were looking at a regional species specific um, type of project. So um, MODIS is automated radio telemetry. And if you see these little tags here, they're called nano tags, and they're light enough for smaller organisms to carry them and get tracked. There's not a lot of um, tracking technologies that are small enough for songbirds, warblers, even things as small as monarchs and dragonflies and bats um, to get tracked. So this was kind of a great new technology that came around in about 2013 or 14. Um, this is the small computer that, tr that collects the data. When the birds fly within 25 kilometers of these antenna stations that we put strategically across the Northeastern United States, then that data point is logged. It's almost as if that, those antennas act as their own banding station. So they collect the data from the birds that we attach transmitters to or any researchers working on any species throughout the Northeastern United States or anything south of us. Um, when we first started, this is what we noticed there was a large geographic gap. And it, it, originally we were just gonna look at our own species, like I said, but um, when we started to embark on, uh, we, we, got, we had a successful fundraising uh, venture, thanks to, to Johnny Fisher, Jim Moore, um, Dick Eels. We had quite a good fundraising group there in the beginning and we raised enough money to get the attention of uh, the State Game Commission. And they had a great idea. They said, well, you know, come on in, let's talk. And, and what we were telling them was, uh, you know, at this point, there's a large geographic gap. You could actually band something in, in a, you know, Montreal, Canada, and it could fly through the entire Northeast corridor, like a Swainson's thrush or a wood thrush and never eat, or a great cheek, and never even get pinged by a station. So this provided a big opportunity for us. And um, as a result, the Game Commission fund and DCNR funded a, the first statewide array in, the nor in North America. And once that happened, it literally put us on the map and that drew the attention of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And we were able to um, take Jeff Bueller's work that he had worked on uh, migration with the next red weather data to see where the hotspots were of stopover migration ecology. And they allowed us to build another 40 towers throughout the mid-Atlantic states funded by the US Fish and Wildlife Service to help researchers working on species that are using this corridor. Um, 
So we were lucky enough and amazingly, uh, after within the next few weeks, we will have put up a hundred MODIS stations since we started, thanks to all the generous support of all our donors and, and these grants. And that will account for 10% of the entire MODIS network. And that makes us the second largest collaborator next to Birds Canada, who is the, the mother ship of MODIS, as I call them. They collect all the data and, and do all of that other stuff. And in the next three years, we will be putting up another 50 stations throughout the New England states. Um, it's pretty impressive. Uh, this is Todd Alliger, whom a lot of you know, and he actually was put onto the New England great uh, grant and has migrated to Freeport, Maine to help with the next three years uh, build out that network. Uh, and that's being run by New Hampshire Audubon primarily. Let's see. And the results so far, so COVID was interesting because we were all sitting at home, not in the field, but that gave us an opportunity to uh, download data from 60 of our stations from 2017. Turns out we had 11 million detections of 1,525 individual birds, bats, and butterflies of 75 different species. Um, so that was really impressive, <laughs> considering we hadn't had all those stations up that whole time. We have been building this network over time. So the future looks really great for, for other um, projects. How do we do all this? Well, you're looking at all the people that are doing this. It's Allison, it's, it's Luke, it's Dave, it's Scott. It, we are a team and each person, it's a diverse group of people that all have different skill sets and have come together to uh, create this incredible project. And they all, look how happy they are. Look at the smiles. <laughs> and we just, we, they have fun, but they're doing meaningful work. And it's been incredible. Like it's such a great, network of people, everyone working together for a common cause. It's been very powerful and can't ask for any better people. You have Allison Fetterman who's speaking tonight. Shelly Eshelman's our newest MODIS technician, but she's on the road along with Jonathan Rice and, and the rest of the crew. Uh, who's, the guy, who's the guy on the tower? That looks that's, like the tower I donated. Yeah, that's Jonathan Rice. It could be oh. one of the towers you donated. <laughs> um, and we also because of COVID have taken off on our MODIS curriculum and Caitlin Welsh, you'll hear from her as well. So, you know, it's one thing to build infrastructure and do research, but it's another thing to then get that research into the hands of a lot of different types of people. Um, and that's really, Birds Canada has done an amazing job. I call them the Google of, of bird conservation because they're taking very complicated projects and research um, publications and, and making them accessible to the, co the general public. And I think that's the key for these big problems is to, to get this into the hands of many different people at different levels of understanding. Um, education, collaboration is another key. If you had told me any, at any time that I'd be working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and all of these different state agencies, I would have thought you were crazy. But a little land trust in, in Willistown is now part of a, a global network and we're, we're actually mentoring the Western states, the, the, uh, we're, we're trying to work in Costa Rica and, and Tennessee. We're, we're bringing all the regions together with uh, Birds Canada and Birds Conservancy of, of the Rockies. So it's been, it's been interesting how quickly we kind of get, gained our place here. And then of course, this also brings a lot of um, universities into the fold, all different universities that we would have never had access to are use, utilizing the, the infrastructure that we've built for their research projects. Um, and what makes it work? I, I always say this, we figured out some kind of secret here using birds, technology and education. And, and that together with collaboration is just been a very powerful mechanism. And I feel as though what before it used to take decades to find trends and, and gather information, where now we're gathering information in, in a period of a year or two. And it's, it's just been an incredible project. So I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Blake Gall, Allison Fetterman and Caitlin Welsh, all part of the BIRD team. And they're gonna just give you a little bit, a, a couple of stories about how this network is being used. And it's really just a, a small piece of, of the bigger picture, but it's interesting nonetheless. Okay, let's see, I gotta stop sharing here. Okay. All right, 
thank you, Lisa, for that wonderful introduction. Um, maybe before I, I screen share, I'll, while we're in the Brady Bunch view here, as Caitlin calls it, <laughs> I'll just, just want to let, <laughs> I just want to let everyone know that um, these virtual events that we've been doing are recorded, and uh, we just went live with this one on Facebook. Um, so not to make you nervous, but just want to let you know. <laughs> and, uh, and because we are live on Facebook with some people who may not be familiar with the Willistown Conservation Trust, I just want to um, say a, a few sentences uh, about it. So as Lisa mentioned, we are a nonprofit land trust. Uh, we preserve land in the Willistown area, Newtown Square. We were hatched in 1979. Uh, thanks to Bonnie Van Allen, who's on the call today. Um, we preserved over 7,500 acres since then of wildlife habitat, scenic views, and agricultural grounds in the Willistown area. We have three beautiful nature preserves, which are all open to the public um, during this time. There's Kirkwood Preserve, Ashbridge Preserve, and uh, Rushton, which Lisa mentioned is where we do our banding and where we illustrate how it's possible to grow food while benefiting wildlife. Um, and I encourage you to check out our website to learn more about all of our other uh, robust programs that we have gotten into over the years. Uh, our mission has really evolved to connect people to nature instead of just simply preserving land. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, and with that, I will share my screen and just, uh, let's see here. There we go. All right. So one of the most, well, they're all interesting, but um, this is an interesting study that uh, some researchers did up in uh, Southern Ontario on one of the widest studied um, birds, the white crowned sparrow. Um, showing how neonics, uh, neonicotinoids are possibly contributing to some of these steep declines that Lisa mentioned in our songbird populations. Um, so I'll just start out, neonics, um, this is the headlines we've seen in the news. Um, the European Union banned neonics in, back in 2018, at least the use of outdoor neonics. Um, so, we know it, it's not good for some parts of the of the environment like the insects but what about these larger ecosystem effects and how does it affect birds uh, so neonics are a systemic agricultural insecticide uh, that actually mimics uh, nicotine that's where the name neonicotinoid comes from um, so the seed uh, companies coat seeds like um, corn and soybeans in these neonics and it persists throughout the entire plant's life. Uh, and so this is just a neat little uh, infographic I found online uh, that just shows how it's not just the plant that's affected and it's not just the target um, plant pests, the agricultural pests that are affected. We know it, it affects some non-target organisms like the honeybees and the other the pollinators. Um, it will it persist you know, longer than these chemical companies would have you believe. Persists in the environment, um, seeps into the soil, goes into the water. Uh, insects are also negatively affected. Uh, so what about the birds that feed directly on these neonic coated seeds? So that's what this study is about in Southern Ontario, which used MODIS to show that it indeed reduces fueling and delays migration in this songbird. So a little history, a little um, ecology of the, this bird. It is a northern, northern breeder. Uh, breeds in Alaska and Arctic Canada. And then it comes down, we can see this bird during migration. Um, so it breeds in uh, kind of high alpine meadows and tundra type habitats and then it will come down sort of looking for that similar open uh, type habitat where it feeds and fuels up during migration. Um, you can see it in your backyard, they'll mostly be eating weed seeds and grass seeds. Uh, they also eat some grains like uh, corn and barley. 
So you can see how this species is a prime candidate for studying effects of, um, of neonic coated seeds, because they certainly come into contact with them in their natural lives. So the researchers at Long Point Bird Observatory uh, tagged, uh, banded, caught and banded, and also nano tagged some of these white crowned sparrows. Um, they had, they measured the body composition before and after they exposed the sparrows to the neonict neonictinoids. Um, they had two control, there was a control group that didn't get exposed at all. Then there was one that, a group that got exposed to low levels and a group that got exposed to high levels of um, neonics. And even the high levels were still pretty small doses, just um, they made it very comparable to the amount that the bird would encounter and ingest in its natural habitat and its natural um, migration. Uh, and so they found that the birds that were exposed to high levels, they dropped their body weight by 6% in the first six hours. And they, and then they, because they were nanotagged, they were able to use MODIS to understand their movements then once they were released and after they had ingested the neonic. And they found that the ones that were exposed to the neonic at high, high levels actually delayed migration by three and a half days. It took them three and a half days to resume migration as compared to the control that just continued migration as normal. And if you remember, I mentioned that um, it mimics, neonics mimic nicotine. So there's appetite suppressant effects. And so these birds are eating less and therefore then they need that extra time to recover and regain their fuel. Uh, and so three and a half days might not seem like a lot, um, but migration, the timing is so critical that it, it affects their survivorship and their breeding. For example, the white crowned sparrows, they, they pair up very quickly um, in the Arctic, even before the snow melts. So if you're three and a half days late, you may not breed that year. Um, so pretty serious effects and uh, maybe why we're seeing some of these declines, especially in uh, farmland birds and our other migratory songbirds. So not only do neonics directly cause insect declines, but also declines in um, bird populations. But going back to the importance of MODIS, the study would not have been would not have been able to have been completed without MODIS. Um, MODIS allows us, as uh, Stu McKenzie of Bird Studies Canada says, it allows us to spy on birds and to know exactly what they're doing every minute of the day. <laughs> so, um, so they can, if you have enough towers in a region, at least three, you can triangulate the movements of these birds. And so then you're learning about these small scale uh, movements and the nuances of, of, their, of their behavior. So they were able to determine exactly when those white crowned sparrows that were treated with the neonics, uh, when they left and how much they were delayed. Um, so stopover ecology is a big one uh, that MODIS allows us to understand more about. So these are some pictures from Rushton banding. We study stopover ecology to the extent that we can. Um, by we look at their, we gauge their fat. So we have a record of a veery that had almost no fat and then we caught it maybe three weeks later and then it, it had, it just uh, it bursted with fat of a rating we gave it of five. So we can see and determine weight gain rates from that and um, habitat quality, judge the quality from that. But we don't know when that veery left. As soon as we released it from banding, we, it's hit or miss if we capture it again. Um, and so, you know, if that bird were tagged, we would able to, we would be able to pinpoint more about the bird's movements. Um, uh, real quick, just some other interesting um, nuances of bird behavior that MODIS is revealing. Post-fledging dispersal, black pole warblers are a really beautiful, long-winged, long-distant migrant, and they nano tag them up in New England and found that the young that were in their first fall actually stayed in the habitat, in the relative habitat where they uh, were hatched for 16 days longer 
than the adults. They took 16 extra days to uh, leave for migration. And one of the theories is that they are actually establishing a habitat image, uh, a map, uh, if you will, for when they return next season. So they're actually learning about the environment and what they need uh, to breed. Um, even the uh, saw wet owls, you know, if we, so we ban saw wet owls now, but with regular banding, it's a little bit biased. So we're luring them in actively. Um, but if we were to get three towers at Rushton and nanotag a saw wet owl, then we can start to tease out exactly what he's doing. How long is he staying at Rushton? When is he leaving? Is he overwintering? Um, do these owls even use Rushton to a large degree? Or are we just luring them in from miles? Um, so it's, MODIS presents a, a wonderful way to learn more about the lives of these birds and the important parts of their lives. Um, and the more we know, of course, the more we're able to conserve them. So I'm I'm Allison Fetterman. I'm a bird conservation associate and the MODIS project coordinator at Willistown Conservation Trust. Um, thanks to for listening to us tonight. Uh, we talk about birds a lot. We all have a pretty good passion for birds around here, but MODIS is the, you know, it's all, all for everyone. So I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about how MODIS is not just for the birds. Um, Oh, hold on. So as we talked a little bit about MODIS, this is um, low tech is the company that makes the tags that go on the flying organisms. Um, and as Lisa mentioned before these tags, there were really no um, transmitters or um, tracking devices that were small enough for even a warbler, let alone something like a fly, a monarch or a dragonfly. So these tags are ranged, they range from three grams that can go on a small owl like those sawwits or even peregrine falcons and to the smallest one that uh, goes on, can go on monarch butterflies and um, large dragonflies. These small um, <clears throat> tags weigh just 0.26 grams and to put that into perspective, that's less than a paper clip, which I confirmed yesterday when I tried to weigh, find something small enough to weigh 0.2 grams. <laughs> and the paper clip wasn't even gonna make it. Um, so they're really small. Uh, the Norris Lab at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada is really um, making uh, headway and they're really the only ones at the moment looking at um, the flying insects and using MODIS. So I wanted to highlight, just show you three projects that they've done recently using MODIS uh, where they looked at the effects of neonicotinoids like Blake just gave us an overview on, um, the local and small scale movements of these insects and their migration orientation. So like the white crowned sparrow, they also were looking at the effects of neonicotinoids on breeding and migration of monarch butterflies. And in this study they did, they had very similar to the other study, they had um, two treatment um, um, plots where they grew swamp milkweed um, with uh, the neonicotinoid concentrations that they would normally find in the agricultural fields and wanted a high dose and wanted a lower dose and then they would they grew swamp milkweed also in a control that had no um, neonicotinoids in it um, and then they they um, put monarch eggs on all of the swamp milkweed and weed and grew uh, and let the monarchs feed um, until they grew pupated and turned into um, adult monarch butterflies um, Throughout the whole, the growth, they measured the caterpillars and they found that the caterpillars raised in both of the treatments um, were smaller, thinner, and shorter than the caterpillars that in the control plot. Um, <clears throat> they also found after they pupated that the adults from the treatment plots were larger than the controls. Um, they're un unsure why they were larger, but they their size had changed, but they did not find any difference um, after um, they were, they emerged, they mated and allowed them to lay eggs and they measured the number of eggs laid and the size of the eggs. And there was no difference between the two, uh, the three um, experiments. 
Um, so then after they made it and laid eggs, they, um, <clears throat> sorry, they attached nanotags to, to, to the adults. They used 14 of the control butterflies and 21 of the treatments. They really expected to see slower movements from the larger treatment butterflies and a deviated flight orientation, much like the white crown sparrows as a neonicotinoid, they, affected, they expected it to affect their orientation. Um, however, they did not find any um, flight deviation um, in the orientation. They all moved in a south-southeast movement as they expected. However, this was a, as a small study with a relatively small number of individuals, um, and it was only done once. These batteries only last, they last less than a month, so they're not getting any long-term effects. Um, so they caution against saying that this it, that neonicotinoids have no effect on monarch butterflies because, of course, we don't know that from one study. Um, it's great that these butterflies did migrate normally, as far as we know, but we, they would like to see a lot more study being done on this. Uh, a second study they, they did, they looked, they took green darner butterfly, <laughs> green darner dragonflies and monarch butterflies and looked at the effects of wind and temperature on the movements of their migratory insects. So they, they caught them in the fall and, what, and looked at their early fall migration. So they radio tagged 38 green darner dragonflies and 43 uh, monarchs. And you can see here, this is where the tag goes. It goes right on their abdomen. You can see just how small that is. They attach it with um, crazy glue gel, which degrades quickly in the environment and the, the tag will drop off so that they don't have long-term effects of having to carry around that tag. So what this study found was they were able to look at, at short, um, small local movements and they could um, record speeds and the effects of temperature. And they did find that the higher temperatures um, yielded higher speeds. That they found they could show that the average ground speed a monarch was flying was around eight miles per hour. But the fastest was recorded at 19 miles per hour. Monarchs I see don't go that fast. Um, and the, the farthest movement they documented was 38 miles. Um, in, in the green darner here, in the green, um, <clears throat> their average ground speed was 10 miles per hour and the fastest individual they documented was 48 miles per hour. This is pretty amazing. And the farthest movement they saw was 27 miles. And now when I say farthest movement, that's in one day. So a one day's movement that this monarch um, flew 20, uh, 38 miles. So that's pretty amazing. And, and without MODIS data, we, without MODIS, we wouldn't be able to see this. This is the first documentation of this kind of movement and speeds that they were able to see in these flying insects. And so finally, a third study they, they did at the University of Guelph um, is they looked at the effects of captive rearing in monarch butterflies. Uh, we know conservation organizations, hobbyists, just anyone uh, with a conservation minded we have taken in monarchs to um, try and give them an upper hand and with their populations declining at a steep rate the eastern populations are to have declined about 80 percent um, this was this has been an initiative to help with conservation and populations um, but a recent study last year was published indicating that maybe this um, captive rearing was affecting their migration orientation where they weren't getting the sunlight cues and in captive rearing and they were, um, they found random orientation in uh, migration, but they weren't using MODIS. This was just observational. Um, so what this, that the University of Guelph, they, they, they used MODIS, they attached tags to 29 monarch butterflies and found that all 29 had um, <clears throat> showed the expected normal migration orientation. So um, they found that very quickly they um, regained their orientation and, and, man and went in the expected south-southeast direction. And then 
a final thing I wanted to show you here is this is the kind of data we get from the MODIS website and this is how they're able studies like this are able to look at time and speed whereas every MODIS station has um, takes has a timestamp um, and you can see in this individual it was released in Ontario and then detected again um, in one of our stations that we put up in 2017 and three individuals were actually got, um, detected in the Allegheny National Forest in 2018 in our, on our stations, which is really exciting for us. Um, um, but this individual went, traveled about 251 kilometers in eight days. So they can estimate the speed just by the calculation that's already in here um, at a, about a kilometer per hour, but that is, it's not a direct flight. It's likely stopped over a lot of places that didn't get detected. But um, it's pretty amazing stuff that um, MODIS is allowing us to look at stopover for these small migratory insects and um, able to look at uh, possible conservation implications. So in the future, we're continuing to contribute to Monarch um, research. This new New England Competitive State Wildlife Grant that we, the trust is part of, um, that grant is funding a project to tag and track monarchs in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. They plan to um, capture the monarchs in coastal and inland sites to get a variety of different locations in, um, along the, the eastern migratory route and use MODIS to track movement and uh, migration orientation um, and look at temperature effects, much like that first, the study with the green darner butterflies. Um, so we hope to see more uh, monarchs come through our stations and other stations. Thanks. Thank you, Allison. So uh, I have had the benefit of um, Growing and learning from Lisa and Allison and Blake as the Northeast Modus Collaborative has developed over the past several years. And I recently joined in probably in the last couple years um, in terms of specifically helping education efforts. So um, this past year, I've kind of been working as a curriculum consultant. We know and care about what we do, um, but in order to have a greater impact, we have to consider how does anything that we do here in Southeastern Pennsylvania affect positive change? So as Lisa pointed out, until recently, our banding program has primarily served to provide information on individual's condition at just one given point in time when we catch them at the banding station. Um, since the program was established in 2009, we've managed to recapture a number of birds that were initially caught within earlier years of the station's operation. Birds like this Viri that was recaptured during this summer's breeding bird survey and this oven bird uh, were aged as after second year birds during 2011, meaning that they are each at least 11 years old. So in the case of the oven bird, she's currently oh, tied, for the, yeah. she's tied for the bird banding labs um, oven bird longevity record. And while it's exciting to celebrate these bird successes in addition to our own, it highlights the significant advantage um, in data collection afforded by the technology leveraged by MODIS. Because uh, the Northeast Most Collaboration has accrued over 11 million detections in just the last four years. Um, comparing that to the 77 million banding records from the BBL uh, archive from the last 100 years, MODIS is clearly able to provide insights into wildlife migration at a much more detailed scale and a fraction of the time. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, just because um, MODIS provides more data faster doesn't mean it negates the efforts of banding. We can pretty much tag because we band. So those things are valuable um, together. Um, for those of you that have yet to see banding at our MODIS uh, or, or learn about MODIS, the key difference is how and when the data is collected. So this infographic here kind of deal details things for you about how to automated radio telemetry works. Um, it just requires a one-time capture and installation of a radio transmitter on the animal. And then that transmitter does the work of countless banders automatically and without the need for vast amounts of caffeine to fuel hands-on data collection for days, weeks, or even months at a time. So the expansion of the network itself has been the bulk of the work up to this point, and it's still going. Uh, now it's at a point where we can think not just about building the towers and collecting the data and doing the research, it's how that information is used to communicate to everyone else, uh, including folks like yourself joining us tonight, and get as many people involved in as many ways as we can. So 
now that we're in a place to start talking um, about what we're learning and figuring out how to use that is not uh, to not just tell people what's happening, but to get them to respond through meaningful actions um, that can help influence behaviors in the long run. So in 2018, I worked with Liza Barney, the education program coordinator from Birds Canada to plan a capstone project for my master's at the University of Pennsylvania um, that would test educational materials designed to promote conservation through migration education that incorporates data from the MODIS network. So the vision for that pilot involved establishing a relationship with a school in our community and creating a hybrid experience that would combine classroom elements with, uh, that made use of the education materials with a field element that gave students firsthand experience observing and learning from the bird conservation program at Rushton. Uh, going one step farther, um, a grant from the Mackler Foundation allowed us to install a co-located tower on the school's campus with the intention of developing a conservation stewardship ethos within the greater school community. Um, so back to Lisa's question about inspiring uh, folks, um, you know, to inspire the effort, you know, we have our grantors and the beneficiaries of that grant um, being open to this opportunity, helping further our efforts. Through this experience, students were able to gain an appreciation for the vast effort that goes into conducting research, uh, develop a personal connection to their local environment and the wildlife uh, with which they coexist, and translate those lessons for other students and educators from their community. The do here is the greatest opportunity for us to expand the reach of our efforts. So realizing the opportunity this program offers to start at the local level and still have exponential global impact, uh, I've been working since March to build off of this experience and further the research of the migration education program developed by Birds Canada. Uh, I've been working in terms of education, I've been working on developing supplemental resources and student activities that will help educators across Pennsylvania tailor lessons and bird studies to uh, a relatable scale for their audiences um, by shedding light on the Northeast Modus Collaborations efforts over the last four or five years um, and facilitating the public's capacity to learn and discover along with us. We hope to make far greater uh, strides in affecting not only people's actions, but their behaviors. So if you go to the Northeast Modus Collaborative website and look up educational opportunities, there's a tutorial that gives you a more in-depth um, understanding of the development of the Northeast Modus Collaboration and what we've learned from it. There's also a video that will teach you how to navigate um, the uh, data explorer section of the website. And you can also go to modus.org backslash education and explore um, the resources. One of the things I've been working on is developing case studies like what you see displayed here that focus on birds of spe uh, species of greatest conservation need here in Pennsylvania. And coming full circle uh, on Lisa's revelation regarding wildlife population declines, I've also been working with the Pennsylvania Game Commission to develop a program that links classrooms in southeastern Pennsylvania with classrooms abroad through bird studies. So um, this map here shows schools and nature centers that are also a part of the Northeast, or sorry, that are part of the MODIS wildlife tracking system. Um, and I'm working with the Game Commission to identify schools here in Pennsylvania that we can connect with schools in Canada with Liza Barney, or even through relationships with Costa Rica Bird Observatory as that develops um, so that we can exponentially strengthen all aspects of the MODIS network and um, the reach of its efforts. So, hope that was fast enough to give us time to talk. Um, I think, um, it would now be a good chance to just offer everyone the opportunity to come visit us at the banding station. Um, you know, learn more about banding, learn more about MODIS firsthand. This is all the information about when we'll be doing it and when you can come out to join us. I think Lisa already talked about that a bit. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us.